Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And on this episode we are going to explore a curious concoction of folklore that includes a ghost that attacked people in church at night, a sacred fish and a giant eel that lurk in magical wells, water that changes colour when people argue nearby, and some divination for those in search of a little love or to catch a thief or for whatever reason you want to predict the future. Now, this is the latest episode in my never-ending occasional series that looks at the ghosts and folklore of water. And in the past, we've looked at rivers and lakes and streams and wells. And on this episode, we will continue by looking at a few more magical wells before drifting off onto other watery subjects. And while some of the folklore that we are going to look at on this episode It's going to get a little bit dark, a little bit creepy, a little bit gothic. Let's start off with a nice happy one, a piece of family folklore, a bit of divination, which allows young lovers to check the suitability of their future husband or wife. And so, to begin at the beginning... Our first piece of folklore tells us that they could carry out this divination by visiting the Silver Well at Llan Blethian near Cowbridge in Glamorgan at the time of this folklore, modern-day Vale of Glamorgan. And we are told that Cowbridge was a great resort of youths and maidens, a great resort for the young people who went there to test the fidelity of their sweethearts and lovers. And they could do this using the points of the blackthorn. The points of the blackthorn were gathered by breaking and not cutting them from the bush. An important point, you break, you don't cut the points. And then, having broken the point, it is thrown into the well, into that silver well. And if it floated... That was good news. The lover was faithful. And if it whirled around, he was also of a cheerful disposition. So if it's floating and whirling, then you're off to a good start. But if it remained like a log on the water, he was stubborn or sulky. And if it sank out of sight, he was unfaithful. So basically, if it sinks out of sight, get rid of them now. And if a number of thorn points fell accidentally into the water, the lover was a great flirt. So there you have it, a good scientific way of testing the fidelity of your other half using Blackthorn in Cowbridge. And talking of magical wells that could divine the future, another one is... Fanon Scython in Llyn, in modern-day Gwynedd, in the north of Wales, where you could check for illness. And to quote, people used to visit Gwynedd Well at Aber Erch to ascertain the result of anybody's illness. A garment of the sick person was thrown into the water. If it sank to the right, he would get well, but if it went to the left, he would surely die. So if anyone threw your clothes, threw your garment into this well, you had everything crossed. Your garment went to the right because if it went to the left, well, that was that was bad news. Although if it was bad news, there is some good news. Another magical well. Who needs doctors when you live in a land dotted with such magical wells. And we are told that in the well of St. Paris in Llanberis, there was a large eel, and this was protected carefully. If this eel coiled around the person, they would be healed. So that's the good news. You could hop in this well, presumably, and if this eel coiled around you, it would heal you. Although there is a 
downside. The good news is always tempered with bad news in Welsh folklore. And we are told in one particular case, a young girl was bathing in the waters. And when this eel coiled around her, she died of fright. So on the one hand, yes, it's great. It can heal you. On the downside, it might accidentally kill you as well. Maybe if you're not expecting to see this eel. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure how that one works. I would recommend checking the small print first before, you know, jumping in the water. Get all the facts beforehand. So moving on quickly and according to the old folk stories, there are also sacred fish as they are referred to, sacred fish in Mary's Well on Anis Llandoin, Llandoin Island. And long-term listeners might remember that I spoke about Anis Llandoin on one of my very first episodes way back through the mists of time, because that is where Santes Doinwen, Saint Doinwen, the Welsh patron saint of love, established her church on this picturesque island. And I won't dwell on that too much on this episode. By all means, go back and check out that episode afterwards if you'd like to hear more. But we will look at the well on that island. The well which was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, to the Madonna. And we are told that the sacred fish seen in that sacred well were unlike any other sacred fish in Wales. Although maybe there is one other well, because there is a similar tale of similarly sacred fish in Peter's Well near Llantwit Major in, again, South Glamorgan at the time of writing this, in the modern-day Vale of Glamorgan. So if you're looking for sacred fish, then depending on where you are in Wales, you have the choice of two, really. You can head off to Anis Llandoin, or you can pop to Llantwit Major. But sticking with islands and sticking with Gwynedd, because there we are told Eglois Virewell in Llyn, opposite Bardsey Island, has a folk story attached to it. And it is said that in the far past, a beautiful woman had a very important wish which she desired to obtain. And one evening, about sunset, a strange lady came to her and said that her wish would be gratified if she descended the steps to the well, filled her mouth with water, then ascended again and went around the church once without losing a drop of water. So it almost sounds like a test of of holding your breath. You fill your mouth with water, you can't let any escape, and then you have to get back up those steps and then make your way around the church, run around the church. Well, you don't have to run around the church, but I guess the quicker you get this out of the way, the better. So up the steps and then around the church without losing any of that water. And in theory, your wish will come true. And we are told that to this day, although this was written some hundred years ago, but to this day, young people do the same thing, hoping that their wishes will be obtained. So, a bit of an endurance test, that one. A bit of holding your breath, a bit of running around. But nevertheless, I think it's probably a bit easier than risking being scared to death by a giant eel. Now, moving on to the well of Llan Bedrog in, you guessed it, back in Gwynedd again, back in Llyn. And Llan Bedrog had oracular powers, which is a word I don't think I've used on this podcast before. It had oracular powers, powers of prophecy, and was frequented by people wishing to find out the thief who had stolen their goods. And to do this, it was customary for the inquirer to kneel down beside the well and utter the names of a number of people, suspected or not. So, You listed, you said aloud, the names of people. Not necessarily people you thought had done it. It could be, it could be your family. It could be the local vicar who would never steal anything. But you listed the names. And at the same time, you threw in a piece of bread into the water. And at the name of the thief, the bread would sink. And on the other hand, if the bread floated 
until it gradually soaked to pieces, the thief was not to be discovered. So, as with the garment floating to the left earlier, in this case, if your name was said, you did not want the piece of bread thrown in the water afterwards to sink, because that meant you were guilty and you were in trouble. What a great way to catch a thief. Which is also a great name of one of my favourite Alfred Hitchcock films. But uh, anyway, moving on to our next well. And folklore tells us that the waters of St. Vegler's Well in Carnarvonshire, again, as it was, as the counties were, St. Vegler's Well were efficacious in cases of fallen sickness. And by fallen sickness, I am assuming they mean what we would now call epilepsy or some kind of seizures. But back in the Victorian times when this folklore was written, they were using these horrible archaic terms. And we are told that people seeking a cure for this fallen sickness washed their hands in the well and then dropped in a four penny piece. Then, repeating the Lord's Prayer, they walked around the well three times. The male patient had to take a cock, as in a male chicken, a cockerel. A female patient took a hen in a basket, which was carried by them in all their movements. After going round the well, the patient entered the churchyard, went into the church, and laid themselves down beside the altar with the Bible under their head. They then covered themselves with a blanket or a thick shawl and remained thus until daybreak. So, quite a complicated procedure so far, and there's one final step. After spending the night sleeping in the church with the Bible open, after getting up the next morning, they had to leave the fowl. They had to leave the bird, the cock or the hen in the church. And then afterwards, should the bird die, it would be clearly understood that the disease had been transmitted to the fowl. So that entire process seems overly complicated, a very long-winded way of doing things. And to me, it reminds me a little of the way the sin eater was said to operate. The sin eater who would take the sins from the departed body so they could go to heaven. But in this case, rather than being passed from human to human, this illness is passed onto the bird, which isn't particularly nice for the bird, it has to be said. And while I love these bits of old folklore, clearly otherwise I wouldn't keep making podcasts and writing books about them. But nevertheless, in some cases like this one, I am very, very happy that modern science has superseded it and we no longer need to resort to such rubbish. But we are told that that wasn't a one-off. There are several wells in Wales where the same process used to be gone through. And if you were wondering if the chicken ever survived, if the bird survived this ordeal, well, in one particularly creepy story connected to one such well, a woman who possessed considerable means went to the well one day carrying a hen in a neat basket. She did all that was required of the patients, but was too mean to drop a four-penny piece in the well. So she skipped one of those steps in that long description just now. She skipped the step that involved dropping in that four-penny piece. And that night, while sleeping in the church, she was awakened by somebody pinching her severely. She immediately got up and in the darkness tried to find her assailant, but was only plunged into worse torments. Some unseen hands laid hold of her. They shook and beat her and prevented her getting out of the church. When the day dawned, she found herself alone in the church. The fowl had been released from the basket and was nowhere to be seen. 
So in this case, it sounds like a, a happier ending for the bird. It had mysteriously vanished. Instead of recovering, though, the patient grew gradually worse and died. And so trying to cheat in this case could prove fatal. And another version of this tale ascribes it to a man who threw a piece of gold in the well and suffered in much the same way as the woman and with the same results. So be careful that you follow the rules. By not throwing anything in or by throwing the wrong thing in, you could be, well, you could be beaten up by a ghost. And nobody wants to be beaten up by a ghost in church. Now, moving on to our next bit of law, and I, I hope nobody's eating during this one. It might sound a little bit unpleasant at first, but bear with me, because wells were known to change colour when people quarrelled beside them. A well near Wenvo in South Glamorgan, again, back in the old counties, was polluted by children throwing mud and manure into it. So the well was discoloured because children were throwing mud and manure into it. And the respective parents blamed each other for allowing their children to do this. So the parents of the children who had done it were arguing. So they were doing the whole, it wasn't my kid, it was your kid kind of thing. And both made disclaimers. And when next people went to draw from the well, they found the waters partly brown and partly red. And so long as the quarrelsome parents lived in the neighbourhood, the waters remained discoloured. But when the parties moved away from the villages, the waters resumed their normal condition. Now, far be it from me to cast doubt on this wise old piece of folklore, but children were throwing mud and manure into the water. The water was changing colour, and the reason it was changing colour, the reason it was now more of a brown, red type colour, is because the parents were arguing about which children had thrown it in. So it was the parents' fault for arguing, and not the fault of the children who threw in the mud and manure. Really? I let you decide what you think was really going on here. Was it the children changing the colour of the water? Or was it the parents changing the colour of the water with all of their arguing and bad vibes? I don't know, but what I do know is that it does remind me of another tenuous link to Ghostbusters. Because in Ghostbusters 2, all of these bad vibes again result in the formation of these rivers of pink slime flowing underneath New York. And maybe there was a similar thing going on in Victorian Wales, but in the wells rather than in the sewers. And maybe, just like at the end of Ghostbusters 2, and I should probably give a spoiler alert here, but the film was released in 1989, so if you haven't seen it yet, you're probably not that interested. But just like the end of the film, when everyone is nice to each other and everything goes back to normal, just like with the well, when those angry people were taken away and just the good people were left, it all returned back to normal. A bit like on this podcast, because now that I've managed to shoehorn another Ghostbusters reference into it, that does bring us to the end of another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And as always, if you have enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever. And if you want more watery folklore, I have recorded a number of episodes on this subject now, so please go back and rummage through the archives. There's quite a few episodes to work through now. And as well as that, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can treat me to a coffee via my website, or you could just leave a nice review or give it a quick five stars or thumbs up or whatever the options are on whatever platform you are consuming this on. And if you'd like more ghosts and folklore in between the episodes you can follow me on social media i'm on twitter 
I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. And as well as this podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects which are available from all good bookshops offline and on with the most recent book being Illustrated Tales of Wales. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and var yawn am rando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And if you happen to find that your drinking water is a little bit discoloured in future, then maybe before you start blaming the waterboard or before you call the Ghostbusters even, maybe you just need to be a little bit nicer. Until next time, no stuff.